comedians don't usually have this big of an audience, so, uh, you know, I'm trying to stay calm. Um, but it's pretty wonderful. Come to Rochester to get an audience. Um, start with the obvious that Susan B. does inspire me. She particularly inspires me in this image um, with her attitude. We all need the uh, umbrella to lean on. This was published in, in 1873, just before her federal trial for the crime of voting. The artist titled it, The Woman Who Dares. I think this month we call it, Nevertheless, She Persisted. Um, to find inspiration, <laughs> to find inspiration in an historical figure is a complex task. In a sense, we create a phantom person for our modern purposes out of odd bits of her life that we value. We craft a memory that connects us across time to a person or events, trying to be true both to her world and to our own. It's an exercise that works best when our imaginations are informed by solid historical information. Susan B. is as popular as ever right now, as several people have noted, while we enter this era of centennials of women's suffrage amendments, yours in New York this year, Michigan is next year, U.S. Constitution 2020, it behooves us all to understand the story of voting rights and Miss Anthony's part in it. Surely some inspiration is happening here. Bear with my outsider speculation since I did not come to Rochester that day. But it seems to me people made an historical connection you, if I may, understood that the act of voting has a history, that women's right to vote has a separate history, and that Susan B. Anthony had a lot to do with our political participation that day. I was surprised by one assumption some journalists made, that this outpouring of gratitude for voting rights was coextensive with Clinton voters. I know that, assor that assertion is bad history, and I suspect it was bad journalism. The fact is, a woman voting for Trump had equal reason to be grateful for the work of Susan B. Anthony. Advocates of women's suffrage often disagreed about whether women needed the ballot as a tool to achieve some social or religious purpose, temperance being the most famous one, or whether they deserved it as a human right. And we know that Stu Susan, we know where Susan stood on that question. Someone asked her in 1895, how she would justify votes for religious women when they were likely to impose their faith. She replied that she worked for the vote only on the ground of justice. Susan's a big underliner. Justice has to be underlined there. And to make herself perfectly clear, she continued, if I knew that a vast majority of the women of the country would vote Presbyterianism into vogue and shut all liberal mouths, I still would maintain that all women should be enfranchised. And she goes on in that letter to tell us what to do, what to do if those Presbyterians impose their religious values. You know, you never know what the threats are. Um, we, should, we should, she wrote, quote, set about educating the rank and file of the women who carried the election in the direction which we considered wrong. Susan B. was first of all an organizer. <clears throat> I did wonder as I watched that day if in this large symbolic action maybe the history of how women won the right to vote got a little out of alignment. How important could one person be to the monumental change of granting women suffrage? And then something happened that day. Women across the United States began to rediscover the political movement that brought us through the wilderness, as Susan would say, to the right to vote. It was as if Susan went on the road again that day, spreading ideas, looking for local talent, and inspiring people into action. On election day, honoring your own local woman suffragist became a thing. So far as I can track it, the practice leapt from Detroit, from Rochester to Detroit. There, Amy Bragg already embarked on a local history crusade, and she has a blog um, about that recognized that she had the graves of suffragists near at hand. And because of Mount Hope Cemetery and the example set here, 
she knew what to do. She found that she had near at hand the grave of Clara Arthur um, in Detroit, and Clara is credited with being the commanding officer during the successful 1918 um, victory in Michigan. Not only did Amy Bragg pay homage at home, but she took the idea nationally. She recognized that the historical connections to our voting rights are woven into towns and cities across the land. And what do you do in this modern era when you gain that perception? You launch a Twitter campaign. And she set up this visit a suffragist. And if you haven't ever looked, it's still up on Twitter. I went the other day just to double check. And all the results are still there. You can scroll through them. Um, I think Ms. Anthony would have loved Twitter, and she'd be very proud of this campaign. Um, one of the tw uh, graves that came in to the Twitter page is that of Elizabeth Piper Ensley uh, uh, in Denver. She's an African-American immigrant from the Caribbean who helped win the suffrage in Colorado in 1893. They're one of the very early states to get the vote. And as I say, this picture was sent in by somebody in Denver to the Visit a Suffrage Twitter campaign. And I suspect that this historical treasure hunt of suffragists is going to go on for some time. While outsiders watched in awe as the lines grew in Mount Hope Cemetery on Election Day, a rip current pulled against the celebration. At a number of online news sites and in posts on Twitter, word spread that day that Miss Anthony was a racist. In the most damning charge, critics <clears throat> said she fought only for white women. Um, beneath the headline, this article stated, her movement fought for the voting rights of white women, excluding African Americans. I'm still quoting. Anthony, who died in 1906, once said, quote, inside my quote, I will cut off this right arm of mine before I will ever work for or demand the ballot for the Negro and not the woman. On Twitter, the same idea circulated. <clears throat> the, tweet, I, the tweet reads, I dislike history revisionists. Stop referring to Susan B. Anthony as some advocate for women's rights when black women weren't included. The charge that Susan B. Anthony did not want black women to vote is simply wrong. There's lots of evidence to show otherwise. But the idea was out there that day, and it's still out there. And the fact that this specific charge against Miss Anthony is false should not, I think, end a conversation, but rather start one about race and voting rights for women. The history... The history of collisions between racism on the one hand and the women's suffrage movement on the other hand is long and painful. And if wishing it away will not suffice, but neither will exaggeration get us anywhere. The decades of, ag it's not surprising that there's constant collision. The decades of agitation by women suffragists were not isolated from major events in American history, like disunion over slavery, emancipation, reconstruction of the nation after the war, suppression of black men's voting rights, and lynching, just to say some highlights of what was going on during Susan B. Anthony's lifetime. In the public arena where laws were written and amendments drafted, national politics were shaped by racial conflict for a century at least. And in the social sphere, a movement that started out among opponents of slavery, who at least talked the talk of racial equality, grew to embrace the whole awful range of American opinions on race. Consider a puzzling story about Anthony and race that seems to expose how political and social pressures bore down on organizing. On December 2nd, 1898, she wrote a lively letter to Elizabeth Cady Stanton. It's one of a, an exchange of several in which Anthony is begging Stanton <coughs> to stop doing this woman's Bible stuff and uh, get down to the real things that matter in the modern day. This is an a, a amazing copy of the woman's Bible I found. That's, um, it's Susan's gift to the Gannets, who were the Unitarian ministers here in Rochester. And then somebody also put a coffee cup down on top of it. <laughs> um, what Susan wants to do is she wants to get, Anthony, uh, get Stanton um, engaged in uh, the problems, the rising uh, conflict and oppression of African Americans. And she hones in in this letter 
on the de new demand that came up in 97 and 98, 1897, 1898, new demand of southern states that Pullman or sleeper cars on trains uh, entering their states be segregated before they got to the state line. And she wants Stanton to uh, take up this cause and fight the fight. And the letter says, and I'm going to show you the letter, but you will not be able to read a word. But everybody needs to see an Anthony letter. Count the underlining and the exclamation points, which I'm trying to represent orally. On every hand, Anthony writes her, is, and every hand, American civilization is putting its heel on the head of the Negro race. Now, this barbarism does not grow out of ancient Jewish Bibles, but out of our own sordid meanness. And the like of you ought to stop hitting poor old St. Paul and give your heaviest raps on the head of every nabob, man and woman, who does injustice to a human being for the crime of color or sex. The trouble is in ourselves. <laughs> the trouble is in ourselves today, lots of underlining, not in men or books of thousands of years ago. So we know we think what we know we think what she, we think we know what she thinks. That's what I'm trying to do there. Sorry. Um, less than a year later, however, Anthony presided over a national meeting of suffragists in Grand Rapids, Michigan. There, Mrs. Lottie Jackson, an African American artist, activist, and delegate there from the Bay City Suffrage Society introduced a resolution to the meeting about segregation on trains that kept many kept black women out of the so-called ladies' cars. The resolution read, resolved that colored women ought not to be compelled to ride in smoking cars and that suitable accommodations should be provided for them. Jackson's resolution was never voted on. It was tabled. The evidence is not entirely clear as to what happened and, or as to what part Susan played, except that we can tell she didn't stand up for Jackson. Newspapers assigned a major role to Laura Clay, a white supremacist from Kentucky who was a very skillful debater and very often got her way in suffrage meetings. Clay pronounced the resolution, quote, an insult to Southern white women and, quote, an injudicious introduction of the race question into the woman suffrage convention. One newspaper, but only one, reported that in response, Anthony swayed the delegates to table the resolution in order to avoid a showdown. So it appears at, this, at best in this scene that Ms. Anthony would not risk a flat out public collision between Mrs. Jackson and her allies and Ms. Clay and hers or risk the damage that clash would do to the National Suffrage Association. To be a force in national politics in a country that was, in her words, putting its heel on the head of the Negro race, she played along to get along. And that was a costly tactic, both for the black women enduring discrimination and for the white women who got away with it. She also implicated herself in that dark side of American history. That incident at Grand Rapids left unpleasantness that still lingers. Lottie Jackson went on to tell her story at the next convention of the Colored Association of Colored, National Association of Colored Women, and those delegates voted first to support her protests about the trains, and then to praise her for going head to head with white suffragists. When she was not faced with tactical crises within the suffrage movement, Susan B. usually acted on her own convictions, I think, about human equality, often quite openly. Traveling in the South, she would expect, accept the hospitality of her white hostesses and speak to their segregated clubs and charities. And yet in the same cities, she almost always also visited and spoke to clubs and churches of African Americans. In 1895 at Memphis, she gave talks to two of the black community's big institutions, to its Women's Club and to the Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church. And then she would walk back uptown to her white hostess's house. How this was understood at the time, I can't imagine. On the same trip at Atlanta, 
she left her segregated hotel to address the black students at Atlanta University, here are some from the time period, um, then returned to her segregated hotel and, I quote her diary, dressed in velvet and was whirled to colored Bethel Church where she spoke again. I think it's important not just that she breaks ranks with the segregated South to act on her own values, but also what does it tell us that the African Americans invited her and welcomed her? At New Orleans on a trip in 1903, she skipped sessions of a national suffrage convention to meet elsewhere with black women at their Phyllis Wheatley Club. It's rare that we can hear in the sources the voice of the black women in these encounters, but on this occasion, someone reported the greeting given by club president Sylvania Williams. Miss Mrs. Williams said, when women like you, Miss Anthony, come to see us and speak to us, it helps us to believe in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, and at least for the time being, in the sympathy of woman. I like Sylvania Williams. Uh, but it looks to me from this distance that here were two women trying to reach across the segregation, neither able to solve it, but they could connect, as, as Sylvania says, at least for the time being. When it came to voting rights, Susan B. Anthony's intent after the Civil War was the very opposite of what the angry journalists and tweeters today claim. She objected to the idea that men had a superior claim to the right to vote. She was fighting for black women's rights. The argument took place first within the American Equal Rights Association, a post-war group made up almost entirely of anti-slavery activists. It began in hopeful days when an alliance of men and women, white and black, hoped to establish through the federal government universal suffrage or voting rights for all, uh, all adult citizens. Um, this is coming up as a petition. I've said so you could read some of it. I've cut off the signatures. This is the copy that Susan and Lucy Stone and Elizabeth Cady Stanton all signed. Um, there's ample evidence that Anthony shared that bit mission of universal suffrage. Here I'm gonna quote, she speaks to a Pennsylvania anti-slavery society uh, meeting in November 1866, right after the war ends, about an equal rights meeting she'd been to a few days earlier in Albany, as it turns out. Um, we had such a meeting at Albany as we never had before, either as women's rights or as anti-slavery women, in point of enthusiasm and in every way. There was but one voice among us in regard to the question that now is the hour not only to demand suffrage for the Negro, but for every other human being in the Republic. The ideal reached beyond a few radicals in the Northeast. In December 1868, equal rights ally uh, George Julian, Congressman George Julian, proposed this language for the, for the 15th Amendment. The, what we know is the 15th was not yet drafted. And I'm gonna read most of that, but not all. The right of suffrage in the United States shall be based on citizenship and shall be regulated by Congress and all citizens of the United States shall enjoy this right equally without any distinction or discrimination whatever founded on race, color, or sex. The confrontation over these, these dreams came when in response to political failures in Congress, the women of the Alliance were told to stand down. Black men had a greater need for the ballot than any woman, was the argument. Here is what a stenographer in the room took down as Anthony's angry words in 1869 as she fought to preserve that alliance and keep alive the dream of a citizen's right to vote. It is not a question of precedence between women and black men. Neither has a claim to precedence upon an equal rights platform but the business of this association is to demand for every man, black or white, and for every woman, black or white, that they shall be this instant enfranchised and admitted into the body politic with equal rights and privileges. Plenty of people disagreed with her at the time, most famously Frederick Douglass among them. This was a dreadful moment of political choices among what were essentially the good guys. 
This is also the most important history for understanding what Anthony was doing and dealing with. In the outcome, Congress wrote amendments that promised federal protection only for the voting rights of black men, while it also strengthened the power of states to decide who could vote. Women were its first victims, but Susan understood that to let one group deny a voice to another group was a very dangerous precedent to put into place. Listen to her in 1873 when she was resisting federal charges um, that her vote had constituted a criminal act. She says, it will not always be men combining to disfranchise all women. Indeed, establish this precedent, admit this right to deny suffrage to the states, and there is no power to foresee the confusion, discord, and disruption that awaits us. There is and can be but one safe principle of government, equal rights to all. What she envisioned in that speech in 1873 as a drear possibility became the daily news after 1890. Beginning with Mississippi, southern states one by one used that power to discriminate to make black men ineligible to vote. Anthony recognized a link between those events and her own political mission, and so did many African American leaders. By the end of the 19th century, she was arguably the most senior advocate in the country for expanding voting rights. One case in point, after the Commonwealth of Virginia rewrote its constitution to exclude black voters in 1902, James Hayes, an African-American lawyer from Richmond, decided to mount a legal challenge to their exclusion. Um, and lest there be any doubt about the intention of this change, um, this is the reassurance to the white voters that they'll be okay when the constitution's rewritten. Early in 1903, Hayes came north in search of allies and money to take a case to the Supreme Court. He did not immediately meet Susan B. She stayed here in Rochester and sent a letter to Hayes's large integrated rally at Cooper Union in Manhattan. As newspapers reported her letter, the original doesn't survive, um, she expressed a wish, quote, to join with those who are the sufferers with my sex in their lack of voting rights. Her simple act, her letter to a meeting, provoked quite a reaction in the Deep South. In New Orleans, the white supremacist editor of a city paper slammed her for that letter. She loved the African American too much, he wrote, and failed to grasp the need for white supremacy, he warned. He, he asked white women of the South to steer clear of Miss Anthony's causes. Anthony later did meet Mr. Hayes here in Rochester at another large rally on his, on his tour in Central Presbyterian Church, called to condemn the Southern assault on voting rights. It's a wonderful event to read about that I think this city could be proud of. On stage were two local African-American activists uh, with whom Anthony had worked closely on other campaigns. Hester Jeffrey is a strong woman suffragist as well as a national activist in um, civil rights. And John Thompson had worked with Anthony on, um, the, he's the man behind the Frederick Douglass Monument here in the city. Mayor Rodenbeck presided, and when he completed his speech about Southern atrocities, he introduced the stars of the event. Miss Susan B. Anthony, age 83, and Mr. James Hayes, speaking together from the same platform. Freedom without voting rights was a mockery, Anthony proclaimed, whether the individuals were black men, black women, or, black, or white women. She joined the issues of race, gender, and voting rights to revive her claim to a citizen's right to vote. Let's be inspired by Susan B.'s enduring commitments, commitment to voting rights, as the fundamental right of American citizenship. That's a goal certainly not realized in 1920. At that time, when the amendment was passed, the majority of African American women in the US lived in states that barred people of color from voting. By the Voting Rights Act of 1965, some measure of equal suffrage 
among women was achieved, but to this day, the states still retain and still use their power to limit and deprive US citizens of a right to vote. To fix that problem might be the most consequential celebration of the work of women suffragists we could come up with. And let's be inspired finally by Susan B. Anthony's energy. This is how an artist portrayed her at age 85. May I be so lucky. Um, as she chased down that's former president Grover Cleveland, who's was getting chased for his reactionary views on women. May we all go and do likewise. Thank you.